All right, today we are looking at art of the Near East, uh, Mesopotamia specifically, uh, or in particular. Um, many scholars refer to the ancient Near East, more specifically Mesopotamia, as the birthplace of civilization. Here between the Tigris and the Euphrates River, the modern day Iraq as we know it, uh, became the first uh, true urban center developed in the historical period, was ushered in the new, or uh, in the invention of writing. So uh, during this period of time, we see um, not just huge uh, um, movements in architecture and art, but literature, writing. We see the first uh, uh, real stories being told, if you will, that get handed down. Uh, this region was initially made up of independent city-states, each under the control of a particular deity or god. Uh, and these city-states would rise to power and prestige, uh, one after the other. Um, and with uh, each, you know, um, defeating the other battles and so forth. Um, we're going to take a look at sort of the rise and falls of those different uh, uh, particular cultures that sort of took the lead um, and, and sort of what their uh, contributions were and how they were different than the uh, culture before them. So the Sumerians are the first we're going to talk about. The Sumerians um, were a culture uh, that created the first language. Uh, the Sumerians fell to the Akkadians who were uh, in turn conquered by uh, the Guti, a mountain people outside of the Mesopotamia, leading to the resurgence of the Sumerian uh, a few centuries later. Uh, the Sumerian return to the power did not last very long as the region soon returned to independent city-states, and now this equilibrium, equilibrium the Babylonians rose to power. Babylonia then suffered several attacks from a variety of nations giving rise to the Assyrians and the dominant power in the region. The Assyrian Empire eventually dis uh, disintegrated and became uh, the Babylonians uh, became to... Uh, uh, to rise. And so we're going to take a look at how each of these uh, different um, cultures uh, contributed differently to the, the progress of Mesopotamia. Uh, there are several essential common characteristics that link the different ethnic groups in this area. First of all, urban centers were built around a great temple, uh, these ziggurats or these platforms, elevated platforms. Um, secondly, without a local supply of stone, the architecture was somewhat limited to this mud brick and timber reinforcement. And the lack of stones also limited the size and scopes of the sculpture in the region. And thirdly, because of the extremes of climate and the political upheaval, no wall paintings survive in any reasonable condition like we've seen from some of the previous uh, cultures. All right. So the Sumerians, this culture is known for being the first people to create the system of writing. As the urban centers and the economies of Sumerians developed, so did their need for record keeping. Uh, they began record, uh, uh, transact recording transactions with pictographs. Uh, these were like little, uh, so those hieroglyphics that we see from the Egyptians. On clay tablets in between 3400 and 3200 BCE, eventually these pictographs evolved into wedge-shaped signs and the first known writing system called cuneiform. And... Um, this was uh, a, a complex grammatical construction. I mean, all these, the, the, the idea that you could create sentence structures and, and stuff was brand new and uh, lent itself to uh, the uh, first real writings. And we see uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, which predates the Iliad and the Odyssey by nearly 1,600 years. And if you haven't yet read the Iliad or the Odyssey, you will. They're the basis of every story. When you read it, you go, hey, that's like that movie I saw. And you realize that every movie ever made is either the Iliad or the Odyssey, which are pretty much the same story. Uh, Epic of Gilgamesh uh, uh, predates. Uh, it, it is there. You can click and read it. It's extremely long. Uh, it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, Gilgamesh was um, uh, this really um, well-thought-of king, we'll say. Uh, he was... Uh, quite the man. Read the read the read the poem if you like. It's pretty interesting. Uh, Sumerian sculpture uh, continued to develop uh, since the Neolithic period, and we looked at that earlier. Uh, but we see these votive statues, uh, the statue of Ur. This is a bullhead, and so I'm not going to go through all these because again, I have to auction off the entire Mesopotamian <laughs> Mesopotamian uh, culture and period in the next uh, 20 minutes, 15 minutes here, so we can get you all into some breakout rooms. Uh, the stand of Ur represents six registered these, a series of superimposed rows of pictorial narrative in two sets of three. And so if you see what they're, what they're talking about here, is this is sort of like a little story being told. Um, the box itself is inlaid with shell, lapis lazuli, and red limestone. I love lapis lazuli. That's that blue stone that was so common 
uh, in that uh, region of the, of the world. The original shape and purpose of the object is actually unknown. The composition depicts the uh, or the composition depicts the composite perspective with which you are now familiar. A new element is hierarchy of scale, scale where a subject of greater importance is great, given greater size. So the more important you are, the bigger you are. Notice the person of honor, the king, perhaps in the upper left register, he is certainly much larger than the musicians, servants, or other banqueteers. I think those musicians should be really big because they are really cool. I wish I could play more instruments. Bullheaded liar. This was another remarkable work of the bullheaded liar. The bull's head, horns are gold, its beard is lapis lazuli. Uh, the bearded bull is a royal symbol throughout Mesopotamia. Uh, we're going to move on quickly. Never fast enough. The Akkadians in 2334 BCE, the city states of Samaria came under the control of the powerful leader Sargon I of Akkad. Of Akkad. Mm. Under the kingship of Sargon, the ancient Near East peoples would henceforth submit their loyalties to absolute rulers rather than that city state that we'd seen before. Uh, the exact location of Akkad has not been yet determined. Uh, a few artifacts remain. Bronze head of Akkadian ruler shows the head obscured by the great beard, which pulls the eyes of viewer downward in a drizzling effect or dizzying effect. Excuse me. All right. Um, da -da -da -da. Grandson of Sargon I, uh, Naram Sin, now king, dominates the scene in his hierarchical scale. He stands tall, weapon in hand, vanquishing the scene of his enemies. Again, using that hierarchy of scale, bigger you are, the more important you are. Um, let's go on. Between Akkadian and the Babylonian rule, a powerful as the Akkadian dynasty claimed to be, they were no match for the Guti who invaded Mesopotamia from the northeast and conquered the Akkadian Empire, completely destroying its capital, uh, AK, Akkad. I'm not pronouncing that correctly, I just know it. The only city to escape the dissolution, uh, desolation brought on by the Guti were the Sumerian city of Lagash, whose ruler, Gudye, ascribed the city's deliverance to divine intervention and thankfulness. He created many votive statues of himself, all created from uh, diorite or dolerite. Uh, the material was extremely hard stones, to indicate his order and favor with the uh, divinity would last a long time with these sculptures. Um, Babylon, uh, you've probably heard of Babylon. Following the instance of, uh, influence of uh, Judea, uh, Judea, excuse me, in Mesopotamia came under the control uh, of king uh, the, of the kings of Ur in what the story is called the Neo-Sumerian period. The Neo-Sumerian period. This dynasty uh, reign was short-lived. And the region soon returned to its political makeup of completing of competing city states. Um, so we see that uh, out of you know uh, this vacuum rose this uh, Babylonian king uh, who brought most of the Mesopotamia under control. He reduced the conflicting legal system, um, unified the laws. We we talk about these uh, codex of laws. Uh, it's the same type of thing that brought together uh, other large. Um, civilizations, China, and so forth. When you codify a legal system, it kind of brings people together. Uh, on this cap, uh, he approaches the throne of God Shamash, the God wearing a four tiered headdress, feet elevated above the ground. Uh, this is what we're seeing here in this one. Um, and understand that most of the art created throughout this entire time is documentary in its purpose. Almost all of it is there to. Um, document the rulers to um, preserve their rule for all of eternity to um, cement their place in history that's what all of this art is created for none of it's really reflective of uh, the society as much as it is the the king and so forth uh, we're going to move quickly the Assyrians Babylonians were overcome by uh, Hittites um, balance power shifted uh, you should know that um, Mostly the about the, the 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 Assyrians. I would care for you to know is that they had uh, more access to stone uh, for sculpture than the other groups, and we see not only that affects uh, their sculpture but also their architecture. We see this reconstruction of the palace of Sargon II. Um, the complex, which is also housed the government offices and the Marriott Bricks, was dominated by seven tiered uh, seven tiered ziggurat, and so. Uh, they weren't able to accomplish uh, that if they didn't have stone like you may have seen, like we saw in the previous cultures. Uh, that uh, ability to have those materials on hand uh, to 
uh, enhance their architecture and their sculptures, kind of what made the Assyrians more artistically advanced than those cult cultures we see uh, before them. Uh, da -da -da -da. All right, uh, let's move on. Babylon, the Assyrian Empire began to erode in the seventh century BCE due to an overextension of its borders with the uh, eternal revolts. Uh, the Assyrian Empire collapsed. Now that disorder, Babylon once again rose and came in, uh, came control of Mesopotamia. Um, never lost its cultural importance to the rule of the Assyrians. Um, Nebuchadnezzar was the most famous of these Neo-Babylonian kings. Uh, he added a palace, a ziggurat, eight memorial arched gates in the city. And again, we just see uh, the art moving forward and uh, we see lots of more color being added again because they had uh, a little bit of uh, access to better materials we see uh, more permanent art being created in Persia uh, the Persians came out of the mountains of the region east of Mesopotamia and modern Iran captured Babylon uh, Babylon under Cyrus the Great uh, one of many Persian conquests so great was the Persian Empire that it stretched from India to the east and Egypt in the west to the Danube River in the north. Uh, the Greeks were the only ones who prevented the Persians from pushing well into Europe. And by the 5th century BCE, Persian Empire was the largest empire the world had ever known up to then. Um, we are going to stop here. And uh, and I want to let you all do a little uh, research through this on your own. We're going to take a look at our um, breakout room assignment. You all are going to... Answer these three questions. Get together. Find out who was the most famous of the Babylonian kings uh, by the 5th century BCE. Who what was the empire that was the largest known empire in the world? Who were the first people to develop a system of writing? <clears throat> I'd like for you to answer those questions. Uh, get together and do the research uh, with the members of your group. Again, this is not the most difficult research project, but we're still in the process of trying to learn a little bit about that process and how it all works. All right, guys. Uh, I'm going to be with you in just one second.